I try to do today with you. By the way, my English is a little better than Chinese. Who is speaking English can do it. Can use English. My Chinese will be very poor, you know. So you would understand me. So uh, I was told that uh, many you here are a young group of students, bright, who have either made already the choice to become scientists or are thinking of it. And I'm trying to tell you why I should do science. Now, I have to start with uh, an important statement, which is, to me, is very emphatic. Science is a unique profession. Why is it unique among human activities? Because the goal of science is the advancement of knowledge. And this is a unique. All other activities don't have this particular uh, uh, goal. Now, uh, I do not know why you have decided, if you have done it, to choose science. I tell you that there are very many noble ways of doing it. For example, when I de decide to become a scientist, it's not because I wanted to advance knowledge. I was more ambitious. I wanted to walk on paths, on ways, on which nobody had walked before. So it was a little bit of a selfish opinion. Now, uh, since I, I will try to tell you about my how it was in my case, since I am a biochemist, I will talk mostly about biochemistry, not all of it, but mostly about biochemistry. For example, I enrolled in biochemistry, uh, excuse me, in medicine. I decided to, go, uh, to begin with medicine in a small Italian university. And uh, they are in three or four years. We had all sorts of lectures on chemistry, biology, anatomy, microbiology, uh, even physics. It was not so exciting, actually. So <coughs> after a few years, when I was on year four, I decided to join the Institute of the General Pathology, which was an institute where I could learn something more about biology because I was interested in that. And I did. Now, uh, there, I, for the first time, I learned the anatomy, the molecular anatomy of a cell, and what it contained and how it worked in the way one could know 60 years ago, because that was 60 years ago. Uh, I joined the institute. The institute was essentially had one interest, in which was mitochondria, work on mitochondria. Now, I don't know whether you know what mitochondria are, Mitochondria, uh, if I can put it, is our organelles in this cell, which are spherical organelles, as you see here, which contain <coughs> a fluid called matrix, and they are, li they are limited by two membranes from the remainder of the cell. Now, those were the years when the work of mitochondria was done in the most important laboratories in, in highly advanced scientific countries. For example, people were already isolating mitochondria, breaking them into pieces, and understanding what they were doing, which was a process called, called <coughs> oxidative phosphorylation, which is simply a way to produce energy uh, the energy that we use all day is produced 99%, 96% in mitochondria. Our small uh, university was way behind all this. So uh, we, you probably will be surprised if I tell you that one of my first uh, orders from the supervisor was to prepare ATP, my own ATP. Now ATP you buy all over, you know, now, but making ATP for a young man like me who had very poor knowledge about chemistry and all this was a complicated matter, but I somehow made ATP. And we <coughs> kept working on mitochondria, publishing work which ended up essentially in Italian journals. 
he was not really very excited, but you know, as when my graduation time was coming close, somehow I decided that I could change my life. See, I was a, a young man with uh, some imagination, I suppose, and I wanted to do something completely different. And I, I, had read, I, was, uh, I was very, very enthusiastic about psychoanalysis. I had read all one could read on Sigmund, Sigmund Freud and by Sigmund Freud, and I decided to try to go into psychiatry. So I accepted the position of assistant in the Department of Psychiatry of the University, and I went there with my dream, beautiful dream of understanding the function of the mind, uh, the way in which uh, behaviors like aggressiveness, love, or whatever, fury started, and I was full of enthusiasm. Of course, it didn't last much. There were childish dreams, and in, 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 in the clinical environment, like the one I was in, there was no way I could do anything like that. And I became more and more frustrated every day. So after two years, I came back, I resigned from my position, and very humbly, I went back to the Institute of General Pathology. They took me there. They offered me uh, uh, a fellowship of the National District Association of America, of which I could barely survive. And they told me, okay, come back and let us work on mitochondria. And we started. Now, before I go ahead, let me tell you a little, a little bit more of my mitochondria to begin with. I've made some notes here. I don't know whether I can read them because it's not... Um, anyway, uh, these organelles here, these round organelles, are surrounded by two membranes, as you see here. They contain a content of fluid called matrix, and in this fluid there are important reactions for the production of it. Transformation, as we say, no production. Transformation of energy. In the inner membrane, or the two members there, you see, let me see whether I can, I have the pointer here also. Yeah, you see? These two members here, the inner one has infoldings that enter inside the mitochondria. And these infoldings are very important because they contain a series of reactions by components called the respiratory chain, which is where ATP is made. This is what already known in those days. Uh, what is the problem here? That uh, um, the whole institute work on this, but the, um, the idea of having a look of mitochondria, you know, this is the classical image of mitochondria. You all have seen in the textbooks of biochemistry. Now, this vision of mitochondria is a mistake. Mitochondria don't look like that at all. So, in those days, my supervisor, who had just come back from a state in Oxford, told me, I think I want to see the way mitochondria look like in cells, whether they are different or not. And I was actually very interested because there was a new thing. So I wanted to walk, as I told you, on, on, on a new path, if possible. We knew how to prepare uh, uh, to culture in vitro cells from brain, not brain, really, we could not, but muscle, liver, etc., etc. So we made, we made one night, we made a preparation of uh, embryonic heart cells from, uh, from pigs. And he made a little movie, which I'd like to show you briefly now here, if I can, because it's not so easy. And uh, the, we were in for a big surprise, because what happened was, uh, well, excuse me, I have to do something else first, because here, I lost, let me see. Yeah, it was okay. We were this little primitive, very primitive movie. I, I kept it like the way it was, you know. No, this is wrong. Okay, here. Yeah. I apologize, but because, you know, 
working on, on, on such a small, small and an old computer, the old LEDs, okay. No, it's not this again. I wanted this one out. So the first thing we found out that mitochondria were not like the one we saw in the books. They were filamentous, linear structures moving hectically in the cell as you there. And uh, there was no resemblance at all to what you would see in the textbooks of biochemistry. This is the, present, the, present, the, is the way they look like this. And then the, the moving will go on in a, in a few seconds, and you will see the way they are moving in this mitochondria. So that was a first shock that, by the way, now this is common knowledge, but that was 60 years ago, okay? So look at, the, look at all these things here, all these things here are mitochondria. Yeah. Moving frantically, now embryonic cells are rather empty, thanks God. So you don't have all this reticulum, all this other matter. So you could see mitochondria. And they look like this. Now, my supervisor, as a matter of fact, at, uh, in Oxford, had found something very important. He had found a toxin called fluoroacetate, which poisons mitochondria, and uh, uh, it poisons it. I should stop it for a moment here. Right. Uh, yeah. It's not, I apologize for, for, no, this is not the thing. Joyce, so can you help me? I want to stop and then go to the next one. This is the, yes, okay, fine, I can, I can stop it here now, after if I can. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Now this compound called fluoroacetate is a derivative of acetic acid. Acetic acid is, a, probably you know, is a, a very common compound, but it is the last component in the chain of reactions by which in the glycolysis you <coughs> downgrade glucose from food and also other, other things, not only glucose, and eventually you produce a derivative acetyl coenzyme A. Acetyl coenzyme A condenses with oxaloacetate, as I suppose, let me see whether I can do it here. Yeah. Uh, we decided to add fluoroacetate because this compound, fluoroacetate, to it, a cheat cells, in the sense that rather than the cell, com the, rather than combination of uh, acetyl coenzyme A with oxaloacetate to form citric acid, we form fluorocitric acid, which blocks a famous cycle of reaction called cell, called Krebs cycle, citric acid cycle, etc which has the, has the goal, this one, of producing, reducing equivalent full hydrogens in four reactions to be given to the respiratory chain for making ATP. It's as simple as that. However, when we did uh, add fluoroacetate to our uh, culture of embryonic cells, we did see something was absolutely shocking. And that is actually shown here in these two or three uh, movie, movie uh, frames. Mitochondria, you see them there, became swollen. Look here. See what happened to them. And we noticed it already. Eh? They become round. They become, they are becoming sick. We here are witnessing the transition between the healthy stage of mitochondria into a stage in which they are sick and then they die. So we have done what is called, in a sense, and I'm sorry that Professor Baumeister is not here yet. Professor Baumeister is the inventor of the uh, technique, trial OEM, called tomography, in which one sees actually 
the way the cell is organized. <coughs> now, this essentially was tomography. Only it was done 60 years ago with primitive means. So I have acid, I'm not here, but it will come later. I have per, if permission to define this experiment actually paleolithic tomography. So we have done that 60 years ago. I was very excited. Nobody had done anything like that. So I said, here I am working on a new map. And there was, that was uh, the evening where my destiny was sealed. I decided to come to become, to become a scientist, to become a biochemist, and to become, to do work on, uh, on, uh, on, my, on mitochondria. So my first topic in science was mitochondria. And that day we did, we managed, to, uh, we managed to work in the next few days. Actually, I tell you that uh, um, in, after this evening, we were very excited. We started working on muscle mitochondria everywhere. And we even, actually, even managed to publish a paper in Nature. Can you imagine that? There was a young man in a forgotten Italian university. I, that's, I had sent the paper to Nature on the modification of mitochondria in denervated muscle, or pigeon denervated muscle. I got the answer every week, accepted. So, you know, big excitement. So I kept working there for a while, and eventually I decided to go as a biochemist to an important place, one of the cathedrals of uh, mitochondriology, of bioenergetics, which was the Department of Physiological Chemistry at Johns Hopkins University, run by a man, you know the name for sure, Albert Leninger, a stellar figure. Now, all of you know him because he has done, has published a book which is very popular, millions of copies are sold. Actually, Leninger did very important work on mitochondria here before writing the book, but this is not important now. And there, the first thing I, I, I learned when I arrived in, in, in Johns Hopkins is that I had to become a biochemist, which I was not. So I remember weekend after weekend, evening after evening, an hour of time spent on every single page of the most important textbook of biochemistry in those days, which was the book by Fruton and Simons. And I kept feel, feeling better and better every month. There, everybody helped me a lot. And there we did write very decent work in the, in the 1970s to the end on mitochondria, discovering also a phenomenon which was the alternative phenomenon to ATP formation. Mitochondria can take up calcium using energy rather than making ATP using energy. So after a few years, I decided to go back to Italy, and uh, uh, I went to the University of Padua, a much more important university, and there I kept working on mitochondria, but I knew that uh, I wanted to, to go to one big place, and after a few couple of years, three or four years, I got an offer to become a professor of biochemistry at the ETH in Zurich. You're too young to know what it means. It means one of the meccas of research in chemistry and biochemistry all over the world. So I went to Zurich, and there I remained 32 years, and they were fantastic years. First of all, because I arrived in a, in, a, in a place in which I was surrounded by legends, really legends, in the field of organic chemistry. For example, uh, Leopold Rogiska had just uh, resigned when I arrived. And there were people like, in the names you are young to know about, those like uh, Professor Wang, Professor Mikoshiro, of course, uh, know his name, men's like Eschen Moser, uh, Arigoni, uh, Danis, uh, Zebak, uh, all these incredible legends. Eh? And uh, the point is, you must also understand that there was an ambitious young man. I didn't want to be on an addition to the department as a biochemist who would prepare field for them, and this is not at all. And I wanted my, my presence there to be felt. And we started talking with my colleagues, legendary colleagues, about the difference between biochemistry and chemistry. And we, no, year after year, we came to a consensus. <coughs> let, me do what, let me tell you what we eventually said. First of all, a confession of uh, modesty. Biochemistry has added nothing, absolutely nothing, to the real pillars of knowledge in chemistry. Things like 
chemical bond, uh, the reaction mechanism, and so on and so forth. All these are the same. Uh, the, the biochemist has done, done uh, no addition to the essence of organic chemistry, even inorganic chemistry, and being established without the help of biochemistry. However, biochemistry has added important accessory things. You can call them accessory, but for example, two are very important. They are hydrophobic catalysis and the vectoriality of the reagents in reaction. What do I mean? Chemistry, the classical chemistry, the chemistry of uh, Pauling and uh, Woodward and uh, Barbour, etc., uh, was all aqueous chemistry. That is to say, in an aqueous system. Biochemistry very frequently has reactions which occur in an hydrophobic means provided by membranes <coughs> where there is no water. And the result of this is totally different from what you would predict by organic reaction. Secondly, all reactions in classical chemistry are done in a test tube, more or less, where reagents can move in all directions, not in biochemistry. Biochemistry has limitations. Reactants can go here or there, not wherever they want. So this is a kind of vectoriality of reactivity. There is also another point important, which is the regulations. Now, chemists don't care about regulation. They don't have regulation, but we do. Biochemistry is essentially based on regulation. There is no reaction in biochemistry which is not regulated, and there are hundreds of important regulatory systems. If you permit me to say it, the most important is calcium. Of course, calcium is the third in the most important, most uh, frequent element on Earth, and uh, there is practically nothing in cells which goes on without calcium having to say about it. I say so in the hope that uh, a lot has to, has to be done in uh, calcium regulation of biochemistry. Very important things are still waiting, so I hope someone here will take the message and maybe become a calcium biochemist. Who knows? Perhaps yes, perhaps no. Anyway, be it like this, uh, uh, I kept working on this, but one thing is that is, you see, I'll try to leave some messages for you here if possible. One, I just left now, maybe somebody here who decide to become a calcium biochemist. Second message is important. Uh, this is actually essential. You select a topic and I hope you will put all of your energy on it and you will become, hopefully, top level specialist in this topic. But this is not enough. You must train your brains to think to fly high, very high, and think of the entire panorama of science. You may not know why, but you learn things by, by what has happened in other fields next to yours, which makes you real intellectuals not only uh, top level specialist of a given topic, which is important, of course, but, for example, let me give you an example. You know, this compound here is called adenine, is the most important compound in living, in, in, in life. It's all over, you know, DNA, RNA, ATP, all over. Now, I was very interested, in addition to my mitochondria, when I was younger, on the origin, on the chemistry of the origin of life. I read all the most important papers, of course, and uh, uh, I was thinking, there was something that shocked me. And what shocked me was that adenine was the most important compound. Why? Why adenine? And then I know another thing. You probably know it already because you've read about it. Uh, in the prebiotic uh, environment, <coughs> there is one gas, hydrogen cyanide, a very terrible poison, which was very common. Hydrogen cyanide is the poison used in the gas chambers when they want to kill people and condemn to death, for example. Now, I never understood there was a link between, a very simple link between hydrogen cyanide and adenine. And what was the link? Jack Dunn is a colleague of mine, he told me, look, he told me, uh, Leslie Orgel has told me 
that uh, uh, what should be better uh, adenine is nothing but a polymer of hydrogen cyanide. In other words, uh, hydrogen cyanide is H1, C1, N1, and adenine is actually H5, C5, N5. Not only this, it is the first insoluble polymer of hydrogen cyanide. And for life, we need some we don't need gases, you know, we need something insoluble. So, this it didn't have anything to do with my work, but is a, is a, a, you know, many people, I ask many people, why is that? Nobody knows why I Well, I know why now. And then from there, we go from other to many other compounds, and the process of life begins. Not my problem, not my, 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 my topic of science, but it makes me, uh, I should say, if I should forgive my rhetoric, it makes me a better human being. Uh, I prefer to be an intellectual rather than a technician. Now, so this message I want to leave you, but there is even a, a one, more, a, one important message that tells you, goes along the lines, you know, in, uh, in the 1950s or so, uh, uh, 15th, 60s, the most important topic in biochemistry was the mechanism of ATP synthesis by mitochondria. All the big, biggest laboratories all over, from Japan to Europe to, uh, to, to, to uh, not to China, because China was a little bit behind in those years, were working on this mechanism. And there were hundreds of papers, congresses, discussions, even aggressive, you know, attacks. There were even accusations of a fraudulent behavior. Nobody understood why, nobody understood why uh, uh, it was impossible to understand the mechanism of formation of ATP. Now, the, all, all the laboratories, including actually the one who was both related, John Hopkins, were of the idea that uh, the mechanism of ATP formation was the same as that by which glycolysis performs a phosphorylation, uh, a reaction of phosphorylation. In other words, a compound is phosphorylated by the even mechanism, which is well known, and it was fed in mitochondria, there were electrons of the same components of mitochondria who act in the same way. They would make a phosphorylated unknown compound called squiggle, you know, was designated by this sort of symbol called squiggle. Essentially, it went nowhere until, until, at the beginning of the 60s, a relatively unknown British, British microbiologist called Peter Mitchell came in and uh, with a $200 second, this is a legend, eh? $200 second hand, uh, second uh, hand uh, computer, he performed an essential experiment, which I show to you. This is the experiment. He said, all what we have done so far in the chemical hypothesis that there is a phosphorylated intermediate and so on, what is a piece of junk. Mitochondria work differently. What they do is to operate the respiratory chain in a way which creates a difference in the proton concentration out versus in. So there are many more protons outside the inner member of mitochondria than inside. And this proton motive force is used to make ATP. In other words, if I want to be facetious, biophysics rather than biochemistry. Now, this is the study, you know. Uh, I, don't, I never understood why no, but not, none of these big guys uh, working in, in, in Philadelphia, Wisconsin, uh, Baltimore, Amsterdam, all over, Stockholm, uh, have thought of it. What he did was to have mitochondria, anaerobiosis, so no oxygen. He had a, a substrate to initiate the activity of the respiratory chain. And you see, immediately you got an acidification of the external medium. In other words, the demonstration that indeed 
the activity of the present produces a proper motive force. Now, it was a, it was a, a shock, absolute shock. Because overnight, <coughs> all the work on the chemical hypothesis went to the waste basket. And the uh, dozens of laboratories were left in desperation, more or less. They were fighting, they were furious, the losers. And poor Mitchell, Edward said, <coughs> so much, so much accusation that he was wrong, they did nothing. In, uh, as a matter of fact, and frankly, I showed you these things in the middle of the on the, on the left hand side, you see here, Mitchell, of course, didn't do only this experiment. He elaborated on that, and he had this beautiful, I say, my sister, by saying the word beautiful, beautiful thing, you see here. Now, this, now, this is in the, in the inner member of mitochondria. Here we have the matrix, where there is the Krebs cycle, which in four reactions produces hydrogen, the reducing equivalent is hydrogen. So the first hydrogen go to NAD, uh, the first component of NAD is the hydrogen is in the rest of the chain. And what happened then? This NAD has become NADH, crosses the membrane, here it encounters not another component to which it will give the hydrogen, it encounters another member of the respiratory chain which does not accept hydrogen, accepts only electrons. As the, and then what happened? The next component is reduced by the electron and protons go out. Then the, the component which has received the electrons, um, what do I do here, my phone? The go crosses the membrane on the opposite side. Yeah. And here it encounters another carrier. This one accept, accept full hydrogen. So it, it receives the electron and then uh, it extracts the proton which is missing to, be, to, to, to make the hydrogen atom from water inside. See? And then again, all this thing goes on three days, three, three ways because at the time it was felt that the full run of the respiratory chain is enough. This is a matter of resource potential. It's about 1,200 millivolts. It's enough for three ATPs per run. Of course, uh, time came that nobody could question the protomotive force, but people were furious. And they started doing experiments. And to show Mitchell wrong. Now, uh, if you notice what I said, the, according to Mitchell's chemiosmotic hypothesis, the inner member of mitochondria is never, never crossed by hydrogens, never ever, only by electrons or uh, by, excuse me, by, by protons, excuse me. Never crossed by protons, is uh, traversed by full hydrogen or electrons. So uh, there were attempts to correct the hypothesis and Mitchell was very upset. To him, she sees uh, uh, our work was on calcium uptake by mitochondria as a, an alternative to ATP production. He was very much in line with the idea of Mitchell. I sort of became close, close to Mitchell myself and I had long discussions with him and etc. And he was so upset because we were trying to ruin the beauty of this, of this uh, system. And to say that in that what indeed what you have is simply uh, enzymes, proton pumps, which transfer direct. Nobody discussed the, the presence of proton uh, of the proton motive force. It was accepted, but the mechanism was not this elegant mechanism of Mitchell, which is actually here a little bit more, but I don't want to go into the details of it. And then they decided to involved to put in proton pumps which would enrich the outside medium with proton, but not by this beautiful model of Mitchell, in a way which was in a sense a little more, if I a little bit more vulgar in a sense, you know, proton pumps. And Mitchell, to the moment he died, to the day he died, after the Nobel Prize, we won, 
was upset by that, he never accepted the idea of proton pumps. I was telling him, look, Peter, you have obtained something incredible anyway, because you have changed the mitochondrial field biology, in a sense, from biochemistry to biophysics, and you should be happy. No, not because he says, I, I realized, and I knew that, for him the most important thing was not the fact that the, the, this, this concept was logical and explain ATP formation, it happens in, then photons go back, here in, I have another slide here, you see, see, photons go back eventually here, and ATP is formed. Now, he was actually very enchanted by the beauty of the theory, and now, why do I do the mention of this to you? Why did I go to this long explanation of the chemosmotic hypothesis? That is the concept of beauty. Uh, Mitchell was convinced that uh, his theory was so beautiful that it couldn't be wrong. And he was not alone. There are many people who said so. Look here, for example, uh, a very important biologist, French biologist called Jacques Monod, wrote this thing. You can read it. A model or a theory, even if it is beautiful, is not necessarily correct. But a bad model, a bad theory, is certainly wrong. And actually another great guy, Roger Penrose, who died two years ago, a physicist, a mathematician, has tended this, a beautiful idea, as many more possibilities of being correct than an ugly one. Now, I wanted, I wanted to, excuse me, to show you this story of Mitchell for one reason, because there, are, uh, there is a tendency in science, beginning with mathematics, to consider the beauty of results very important, in addition to being correct. Now, I have no time to go into the details, because with mathematics it's easy. There is a mathematician, for example, called, called Graham Watson, an important British mathematician, who said, when I see, he wrote, eh? when I see this equation of Ramanujan, an Indian famous mathematician, I have the same emotion I have that I have when I enter the Medici chapels in Florence, with Michelangelo on this thing, yeah? I mean, one can believe or not that this is important. There is a, a, a substantial number of scientists, even in biology, who believe that it is important to have better, uh, the, 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 the beauty, no, the classical example of course is, uh, is uh, the DNA structure. As a matter of fact, I was at the time in, uh, in Zurich when the first model of the DNA structure by Watson and Crick was, was constructed and displayed in Cambridge. And uh, Jack Dunn, who was working with Dorothy Oshin in those days in, uh, in Oxford, told me that he, he got this phone call the same day that the model, model was displayed uh, in, uh, oh, in, in Oxford. He said, please come, come to Cambridge, this was Francis Creek, because I want to see our model with DNA structure. He went there with Dorothy Oshin, and then he told me, the moment I saw the model, I knew it couldn't be wrong. Um, he, he, was, he was an expert in the, in the matter of DNA and all this, but still, he was so perfect in all that he said he couldn't possibly wrong. Now, I don't want to insist on this. This is a concept that many scientists don't accept, that beauty is important. But I want to leave it to you anyway as one of the messages uh, today. Now, you see, uh, what I've done so far is to give you uh, autobiographic thing. By the way, I noticed that Professor Baumeister has come in. But, uh, Wolfgang has told already that I have uh, asked your permission to call a world experiment on mitochondria as Paleolithic tomography. No. Since you are the, the king of tomography. And I think it's probably good definition. By the way, see, uh, perhaps. You wanted to, you want to know, you want to have advice, technical advice. What should they do if I become a biochemist? Well, look, uh, I don't want to do that. Uh, about 12 years ago, 
one of the important firms in, uh, in uh, scientific communication, Elsevier, since they knew I had many friendships with the important scientists and their connection and so on, I said, why don't you write a book, a booklet, interviewing the most important people in biochemistry? And I thought of it, and then I accepted it. And I have interviewed nine important people, those who have made, had made at the time the history of biochemistry, from Peter uh, to Chikanova to Weizmann to Sela, all these people. Each one of them have, will have at the end of their interview the beauty. This book that is very beautiful, not because I, I did it, but I tried to, I have tried to have SV publishing it, but, but they said no, there is technicality, they, they, they were skeptical, although this is a beautiful book, I think, not because it's me, but I think it is. So maybe it would be possible to print it in China here, if not in Europe, I hope so. Anyway, one of the, the only, I want to quote you one thing only, one uh, suggestion by Charles Weissman, because Charles Weissman is a man full of jokes, and this is, he said, he said, uh, as an advice to you young people, <coughs> take biochemistry only if you can resist failure. If you have something which doesn't work well, try not to give up immediately. Why do I say that? I have here in front of me Professor Mikoshima, for example. This is again something personal. Uh, you know, we had worked uh, for, uh, for my life on calcium signaling, and uh, uh, we, had, we had discovered that uh, in any mitochondrial type, minus, minus yeast, uh, mitochondria could take up calcium, because they are the regulators of the regulatory element, in a sense. What was the problem? that to take up calcium, they needed to see around them micromolar amount of calcium. In the cell, you have only nanomolar amount of calcium. So it was a nonsense, a paradox. And you know, I, I, did, I did a number to do. I did one experiment, though. And did, when I returned, I returned to Italy before going to the ETH in Zurich. I, did, I took rats and I injected to them in the peripherium a calcium 45, radio radioactivity. And then I took liver, kidneys, muscle, etc. And I isolated mitochondria. All of the, most of the activity was in mitochondria. So I knew that somehow, even if it didn't make sense from my experiment in vitro, the thing happened in vitro. Only didn't know why. And then uh, I had to wait 10 years at least until people of which we are we, we, we here, of course, Professor Nikoshima, who is actually uh, the number one man in the mechanism by which endoplasmic reticulum releases calcium. A group in Italy has found out that mitochondria and reticulum are close to one another. And when the reticulum releases calcium, it creates around mitochondria concentration of up to 50 micromolar. So that explains why the mechanism works even if the affinity of Madonna for calcium is so low. So again, <coughs> be persistent. If you are convinced that your experiment is correct, then you run everything well, and somehow the result doesn't convince you, wait. Don't give up, don't throw away everything. Wait, because chances are that later on you will prove it correct as we were, for example. To finish, uh, I believe I should say what I think of the future of biochemistry. To put it simply, I believe biochemistry is the El Dorado for organic chemistry. Each year, you are, there are new, 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 new openings, you know. Ten years ago, we didn't know anything about CRISPR, for example. Even about cryo -yen. We are now the king of Ryan here, sitting there in the audience. Uh, we didn't know anything about other matters of this type. And now, all this is to the new, new, new technology, for example, the technology of DNA encoded combinatorial libraries. All this has changed the area of uh, 
even of chemistry. Now, not C, for example, uh, my colleagues and Moses, two years and years to synthesize nitrogen <coughs> in between by the classical system of orga organic synthesis. Now it is done in a month. Because fields of science which were peripheral to biochemistry, like immunology, pharmacology, and all this, have, uh, have now become more closely integrated into, into biochemistry. And therefore, <coughs> I believe that the future of biochemistry is very, very bright. And since I hope most of you will become biochemists, all I have to do is simply to thank you for being here, and also then especially wishing you the best for your future career as a biochemist. Thank you very much.